following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. It's time for Volatility Views, the premier radio program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll dive into the world of volatility, how to manage it, profitable strategies, and how to avoid the pitfalls of trading volatility. If it involves volatility, you'll find it on Volatility Views. And now, the Volatility Exchange is proud to present your hosts, Mark Longo and Don Schlesinger. everybody welcome back to volatility views your weekly source for all things volatility related my name is mark longo from the optionsinsider.com and the ever exciting ever expanding options insider radio network if you haven't had a chance to check out our newest show the options news rundown then i recommend heartily that you check it out you can find it on our website or just search for Options News Rundown in iTunes or Stitcher or wherever your podcast purveyor of choice may be. It's a great little short five to ten minute take on the top news coming out of the options market, the top headlines for that day. So I think if you like this program, that's a probably a pretty safe bet you'll like that one as well. We're running a little light on the Vol Views crew today. Don is still off gallivanting through Gay Perry on assignment and Mark and Andrew from Option Pit are also off on assignment as well. Everyone's got assignments these days. So luckily, you've got me, and you've also got another able stand-in. Returning for two weeks in a row now, good old Bob Krause, the CEO of the Volatility Exchange. Bob, welcome back to the show. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I really uh, enjoy doing the show, and, and now you get me for two weeks in a row. So, you know, it's a real treat. Don better watch out. If he stays on assignment, he might have to surrender his hosting gig or perhaps share it on a more frequent basis. That's right. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful day here, and um, I was just looking out. I'm actually in my home in New Jersey and uh, looking out my back window, and there is a, a whole family of turtles sitting on a log in, in the little pond in our backyard. And it's just like Yertle the turtle. It's it's amazing. They're they're just sitting there sunning themselves. <laughs> and and if if you know if the cat walks by, they just like scurry like into the water real fast. But if a if a duck go, goes swimming by, they're nah, they don't care. So it's interesting. <laughs> there you go. There's our turtle update, our turtle <laughs> review right. here for this week in volatility review. We're safe <laughs> to say you're not recording from Midtown Manhattan today with the turtles rampaging yeah, around your offices but we have a great show in store for you listeners including a chance to finally get back into the old mailbag haven't had a chance to do that in a while so a lot of great stuff coming we're going to kick things off as always with our volatility review it's time for the volatility review All right, and welcome to the Volatility Review. This is, of course, the portion of the program where we look back on the week's worth of action from a volatility perspective. And, Bob, you've been a fortunate fellow to come on the show these past two weeks because we actually do have some volatility action to speak of. As we're recording this, it is mid-session here on Friday, so we're getting a bit of a, a rally to end this week of pronounced sell-offs with most of the major indices up. Oh, except for the Dow, which is pretty much unched. The S&P and NASDAQ are up close to 1%, or in the case of NASDAQ, a little bit more than 1% today. So there is a little bit of a, of a rally taking place to offset the week of red we had through most of the broad indices. Fixed cash, of course, selling off commensurately, down about two handles to 15 and a half right here. And there was a, quite a bit of, of realized vol this week to discuss movements in all directions. I think we hit it out of the park on this show a couple of weeks ago, and we really said that it looked like from an S&P vol perspective, 
that the uh, the VIX and VIX cash really was going to probably settle into a floor somewhere around the uh, 11 to 12 handle. It didn't seem like there was much imperative for the VIX cash and implied vol in the S&P as a whole to really break through that 11 handle because there was too much going on. And sure enough, no sooner did we call that that floor in the VIX than it did just turn around and rally aggressively up to the upside. We had quite a week here from a, from a realized and implied vol perspective, Bob. What really uh, caught your eye out in S&P land this week? The we were we had our show on Friday and we we basically called that floor at 12 and and Monday the VIX just smoked. I mean, yeah, it, it didn't take up. long to bounce off that floor, did it? Right. I hope you released your show, you know, really quickly on Monday. But, uh, you know, it's 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 tough to get the show out like immediately. But, um, you know, Monday, the the VIX just just shot up to about 17 and a quarter. So uh, it gained about 50 percent in value from the 12 right around 12 to about 17 or so. So that was, you know, an incredible move. And then Tuesday, you know, it seemed to calm down. So everybody goes, well, OK, I guess, you know, that was just a, a flash in the pan. And it dropped precipitously back down to 14. And then the next day it was like, oh, my God, this really is, you know, going to going to take off or, you know, fall down, whatever you want to call it. And 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 volatility just shot right back up into the 17, 18 range again. So it was uh, quite the uh, week for volatility and from a, <clears throat> a realized volatility perspective we we did, about two weeks ago we were down in the seven and a half percent range and and now we're close to uh 14 or so so um that's it was uh you know essentially doubling in realized volatility terms so so we had quite the quite the move this week in s p land yes you know it's interesting we talked last week with our guest shreyas about a number of different topics one of them being the surprising underpricing of uh, of near term downside S&P puts and the the counter argument the counterpoint because everyone here on this show I think yourself I know I do I know Mark and Andrew do as well I think we all tend to lean towards the more direct hedging end of the spectrum where if you have an S&P portfolio you probably want to hedge with S&P puts or S&P downside put spread something along those lines that's a more direct correlation than the than the something like a VIX product or an ETF which is a more indirect correlation but the one counterpoint that people who are proponents of those vol products like the ETFs and the ETNs around VIX the one counterpoint they always bring up time and again is look at these moments when vol pops because those are the days when these these related products really dramatically outperform a near-term downside direct quote-unquote hedge in the S&P. And days like Monday and into earlier last week, earlier this week, I should say, tend to give a grist for the mill for those type of people because certainly they have those days where VIX popped, implied vol in the S&P popped, and those types of contracts, those types of indirect hedges in products like the VIX and VIX calls and VIX verticals and ETFs that, that replicate those really had a great day. Of course, if you didn't get out of it immediately, you gave up most of those gains <laughs> the very next day. But it was, uh, it was a timing issue. But those are the one data point that everyone who does these studies and they compare VIX verticals versus S&P put spreads and things like that. Those are the few data points that really kick in. And if you can harvest a few of those with products like those and those more indirect type products, they tend to make a more compelling case. But I think I still, at the end of the day, nine times out of 10, pick the direct type hedge. But of course we had, we had, well, go ahead, Bob. Well, yes and no. See, um, and I mentioned this on, you know, a previous show, but you know, that was now a few months ago, but in case the listeners uh, don't remember, or maybe I could remind them is that with a volatility product, you're essentially at the money all the time. So in other words, you know, let's suppose that you you saw this coming. You saw that the market was going to, you know, drop or or have a correction, whatever you call it, and you were, you know, worried about that. Except you're a little bit early. You know, maybe you started two weeks ago. Well, two weeks ago, and for that week, that first week, then the market kept rallying, and then when you finally got your your correction or down move, well, the down move just kind of went back to where you were two weeks ago. And the options that you bought 
may not have gained in value, even though you got your pop in volatility and all of that stuff. So it's with a direct hedge like an option, the strike really becomes important. And with volatility, while you're correct that the correlation uh, you know, isn't perfect, it gives you more of this you know, at the money kind of exposure. So in other words, two weeks ago, the VIX was just hanging around a little bit over 12. And, you know, a week ago, uh, even though the market rallied, you know, VIX dropped a little bit down down to 12. And, and then if you were correct with your forecast that, you know, the week, you know, in the next couple of weeks kind of thing that the market would would tank and volatility would increase, you would have made a lot more, say, buying VIX futures or maybe even a, a VIX call option than you would have necessarily with a, an S&P put. Yeah, so you know, it's, it's, just, it's just very different kind of you know, thoughts or hedging. And, and, the, and the problem or the, or the thing you must be aware of with an option is you, you set the strike and you pretty much are stuck there of course, unless you roll, which you know costs costs money in uh, in transaction costs. You know what's interesting interesting about that. And I'm glad you bring it up. Is because you're right. That is an interesting point. That a lot of people are starting to discover with the advent of so many of these ETNs and ETFs and other related products that they could they could test the waters with. And we're starting to see a lot of people, even people who fall into you know my and some other side of the camp who tend to prefer the more direct hedge and people who are you know, uh, let's say, put spreaders in the S&P to protect their portfolio, whatever the case may be, even those people are starting to perhaps every now and then pepper their portfolio with, I suppose you can call it a, let's say, a, a, VIX, a VIX call kicker or a VIX vertical kicker or something like that to give them a little bit extra bang for their buck. So they're not relying on the volatility product for their direct hedge, but they're kind of keeping it in their back, pro back pocket for days like this week or days like Monday and Tuesday when you saw a market pop there in the uh, in the VIX and they could, of course, take it off. And it gives them a little bit extra bang for your buck because you're right. In those moments, the volatility product dramatically outperforms. But relying on that product every day, day in, day out as your direct hedge is a more difficult prospect for a lot of people. So they can they can have what they like and then also perhaps pepper it with that kicker. That seems to be a, a popular strategy these days as well. I agree. I think that that combining the two, you know, especially if you have a larger portfolio and a kind of a comprehensive hedge is uh, is much more uh, wise, I would say, or or prudent uh, than than just kind of relying on one or the other. the The option sounds like it's a great product. You know, you set a floor, but you know when the market starts smoking and moves away from from that, floor that you set well now your floor is way the hell down there you know after after the market rallies and now you have to figure out well am i gonna raise the floor and that's gonna cost me money or just stick with the old floor and potentially give back all of the the gains that i uh, achieved so um you know with a volatility product you're always kind of at the money and wherever it pops you you kind of get the advantage of that though the downside like you said <clears throat> is that volatility, you know, generally falls, and it seems to be much more uh, than than an option would. Uh, but I guess it really depends on which option. But you know, volatility is is a wasting asset as as well as a as a put option or a call option is. Yeah, it certainly comes down to timing, very much so in those products. Yeah. I mean, look what this week alone. You know, if you <laughs> had that vol kicker on and you didn't take it off at the right time. Uh, you surrendered the vast majority of the value of that kicker slash hedge position uh, if you didn't take it off quite at the right time. Now, this week, the vol story wasn't just confined to the major indices. No, no, no. It was a, a broad vol story, particularly out there in commodity land. I know, Bob, you've come on here in the past and, and, and jumped deep into the world of gold vol, and we certainly saw a lot of action out there in gold vol, whether it was on the futures, futures options, on GLD, uh, wherever you like to play the metals, there was some vol action last week. So what, if anything, really stuck out at you, Bob, from the week's worth of vol in GLD and the gold futures and the gold options? <laughs> well, um, you know, sticking out is, is an understatement. Uh, gold <laughs> volatility just went absolutely bananas uh, this week. The realized the one month realized volatility shot up to forty percent, and two weeks ago it was around seven and a half. So it had a five hundred percent increase in just two weeks, and most of that 
obviously coming in the last you know few days kind of thing with gold the the volatile which is you know how volatile volatility is is just like pretty much off the chart it is up to 300 and uh, i don't know 25% it's just an incredible move uh with the volatility and since volatility moves so much, you know, the vol of the volatility was just immense as well. So both of them are just shot off off the chart. You you pretty much, you know, can't scale them high enough to to, to see it. <laughs> yeah, we set numerous records last week from a gold perspective. It was the biggest two-day drop in 30 years and just a number of just mind-blowing levels. If you don't trade gold, you certainly were paying attention to it this week, even if you're not a gold bug like I know a lot of our listeners are. And Bob, something tells me that, that perhaps down the road, once you get all the, the NASDAQ stuff, stuff settled and sorted out, that perhaps there is a realized vol contract on gold somewhere down the road coming. Am I, am I, is my guess perhaps correct, given all this gold interest and gold vol we're seeing these days? Well, I'd love to, and I wish we were you know, up and running this past week. But um, you know, let's, all of this is on the plate. You know, certainly things like crude and T-notes and S&P and... And, uh, you know, all of the major things are uh, assets are on the table for us to launch. It's just, uh, you know, an incredible process, a lot, let's say, worse or a lot more difficult than we originally thought. And it's taking much more time than we were originally thought. But, you know, we still keep plugging away and hopefully, you know, things will break for us and uh, we'll we'll launch um, soon. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> so we've been saying for quite a while, but I think that story yeah. is getting a little bit more compelling, and we're getting a little closer to the day. And who knows, down the road, all you gold bugs out there may even have a gold real vol contract to kick around. And speaking of real vol, it's time to roll on into our volatility viewpoint, where we can kick around some real vol indexes. Now it's time to discuss volatility and volatility trading strategies on Volatility Viewpoint. All right. <laughs> Welcome back to the Volatility Viewpoint. This is, of course, the portion of the show where sometimes we welcome on a guest. Sometimes we just dive deep into an interesting topic or a product or a theoretical volatility discussion, and we dive deep into that realm and see what we can unearth. And today's topic is a little bit different because we have Bob on the show today. I know it's something he's been chomping at the bit to get at for quite a while. I know a lot of our listeners have been interested in this as well. It's one of the new things you guys have cooking over there, one of the revised things you have cooking over there at Volex. And I know some people have already written in saying, what is this thing? So, Bob, why don't we just dive into exactly what we're talking about here? Of course, we're talking about none other than the real Vol Index. Why don't you give our listeners a little bit of an overview of what exactly we're talking about, what you use this index for, and some of the methodology behind it? Okay, good. Um, so, there are even uh, new... Um uh, viewers to our website will notice that we have volatility indices on volx.us. And we've been tracking about 20 or so assets, the realized volatility, the realized volatility of volatility, and the forecast volatility as measured by a modified Garch model that comes out of uh, the Volatility Institute at NYU Stern School of Business. Um, so we, we produce these nine daily indices. And when I say daily, what that really means is just all we're doing is taking the close each day, plugging that into a volatility formula and measuring how volatile it is over time, over, you know, days. Um, and in, in, and in our case, we measure it over three measurement periods, a one month or 21 day, uh, three month, uh, 63 trading days. Uh, 63 trading days, not 90 calendar days. Okay, so uh, trading days is what we're interested in. And then one year, which is 252 trading days. So we have a one month, three month, and a one year measure of these three things of realized vol, realized vol of vol, and this forecast vol. Okay, so that makes nine combinations. And so we have nine daily indices. Now, many of you are familiar with that, but what what we <clears throat> what we wanted to do, you know, n no index that that Volix is aware of currently has both daily and real time versions of an index. 
Most indices are updated on a real-time basis or near real-time basis. Okay, why the distinction in this case? Okay, typically volatility is measured on a daily basis only. Therefore, VOLX created the real vol daily indices to correspond to the standard of using daily underlying reference prices. The R vol indexes are real vol, uh, that's the symbol we use, for the realized volatility indices, the three that we're talking about, right? One month, three month, and one year. And then we use um, our VOV or our volaval uh, as the symbol for the realized volatility of volatility, and that's over three time frames. And then the forecast vol or FVOL. Okay, so we, we got that squared away. Let me, um, before I get into the real time version and what that means and how we had to adjust it and all that, let me just step back and, and just give you, you know, uh, many of you know this stuff, but uh, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, so one key issue regarding realized volatility is that it is measured, not observed. In other words, one cannot look at a particular price and determine what volatility that represents. The only way to calculate realized volatility is to get prices over time and then use a realized volatility formula to calculate the movement of prices for that time frame. This is a key concept because all realized volatility formulas must use historical prices in order to calculate a result. So let's take an example. If the evening news reported that the price of gold is currently $1,000 an ounce, it has expressed only the price of gold. The current price says nothing about how much gold has had to move to get to, to 1,000. Did it just you know, drop from 2,000 or did it just move up from 999? One cannot tell unless we have previous or historical data you know, uh, observed. Thus saying that the price of gold is now 1,000 tells us nothing about its volatility because we lack a, a historical perspective. Okay, so now you understand where, where we have to go back into time and, and get this historical perspective, right? Now, so how do we convert or get a real-time version of something that's only measured close to close? What if we're in the middle of, a, of the day or whatever? So... How we solve this is by calculating, well, let me step back a second. Um, we said we have 21 data points, closing values. And now let's say uh, we know the volatility for the past 21 days. Uh, we're now in the middle of the day, just like it is today. It's now uh, you know, the middle of the day for, for trading on Friday. And we, we know the historical volatility for the last 21 trading days with our RVOL index. So how can we incorporate the current value? Well, we could use the current price and say, well, if that were the close, then we could use the past 20 days of closes and the most recent price, right? And, and then say, well, that's the approximate 21-day volatility. We didn't close yet, so we don't have the true, but we have you know, something close, right? Well, <clears throat> there's a problem with that. And one is, well, let's take it to its extreme. Let's suppose that we're trading the S&P. It's a 24-hour market. Let's say it's 4 o'clock yesterday um, or 3 o'clock from Chicago time, uh, 3 p.m., uh, Chicago time, four o'clock uh, here in New Jersey, and the market just closed, right? And now it opens up again at four o'clock in one second, right? Or, or in fact, it never really closes, but it continues. So with the S&P, it's practically a 24-hour market. It does close for an hour for maintenance and, and things like that. But, you know, for all intensive purposes, it's essentially open all the time. So if we said that today's value, which is now tomorrow, right? We're one second past the four o'clock close. And now we're calculating tomorrow's value. So we drop the 21st day. We now have 20 closes and we're using the current market price as our 21st day uh, value. Well, one second after the S&P closes, 
it's probably going to be, you know, probably about one tick uh, within the, the close from, quote, yesterday, which was a, a, a second ago, right? So what's the volatility for that last day? You know, essentially zero, right? So because it hasn't moved yet today, right? Today's trading. So in, in that case, if we created a real-time volatility index that just used the most recent price, it would spike down because you're going you're gonna to close at 4. At 401, it opens with a value of zero. And so now it, you, know, you essentially weight that at 5%, right? Um, uh, we have 20, 20 observations, actually 21 observations. So it's just under a 5% weight. And, and the weight of that is now zero or zero is now weighted at 5% of the, of the total. And so every day that you were to, if you were to look at a real time, real vol index, just using uh, the most recent price as your estimate of where it's going to close is really wrong because you'll, you know, at the opening of every day, the volatility would spike down and then it would slowly rise throughout the day, depending on, uh, you know, how much it moves from uh, the closing price of yesterday, which is what we're trying to measure in the first place. You know, how much does it move day to day or from close to close? So to solve this problem, what we did was take a waiting scheme and we don't just drop the 21st day uh, immediately, the whole value, and, and then just pick up, you know, essentially the new day one second into the, the market. Uh, what we do is wait it. So <clears throat> we, we chop up the day into seconds and there are 86,400 seconds in a day. And so if we are literally one second past the close, then we have a weight of this new value of only one over 86,400, or essentially, you know, for all intents and purposes, zero weight. And, and then the, uh, the last value or the first value, whatever you want, however you want to say that, 21 days ago, that still has, you know, 85 or 80, uh, 86,399 seconds of weight to it, uh, which is one second less than uh, a full day. And, and so this continues this process uh, throughout the day where we start taking those seconds off of the very first value and then adding those seconds to the current price and this last value or the most current value. Okay, I, I hope I explained that well. Um, I think you get the idea, and let me just give you one more example. And it and it and it doesn't matter if the market's open 24 hours or not. Let's let's pretend that the S and P closes at four, okay? And it doesn't open until uh, nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, in fact, that's the index. You know, if we were trying to calculate the volatility of the index, um, we'd have to wait until the morning because uh, the index isn't calculated overnight because the stock, the component stocks are, are closed. The, the only thing that continues to trade overnight is the futures. So I was saying that if we were basing it on the futures price, we could have a 24 hour uh, volatility. But if we're uh, basing it on the index price, then we can't. So then there would ha be, you know, no change overnight until the market opened again. So that would be, uh, you know, essentially 8.30 um, in the morning uh, Chicago time or 9.30 New York time. And so that time, the, the nine, let's say the 9.30 a.m. in New York is 17 hours after the 4 o'clock close, actually 17 and a half hours. Okay, so it's 17 and a half hours out of the 24-hour day which is 63,000 seconds out of the 86,400 seconds, or if you do the math, 17.5 over 24 or 63,000 over 86,400 has the same weight or fraction of 0.7292, okay? Essentially 73%. 
we are now 73% of the, of the way through a full day. And so when the market opens at 9.30 a.m., whatever value that is, we weight it at 73% uh, weight. And then the very first value that we're starting to drop off, you know, because we're only taking 21 days, right? So the 22nd day back uh, in time, we weight that at only, uh, what is that, 27%, right? So it will have a 27% weight and the current day will have a 73% weight. And so that's how we calculate a, a real-time value from, a daily, uh, from daily observations. There you go, listeners. And that's one to grow on there. So for all of you who have inquired about how they actually calculate these real vol indices of theirs and these real vol contracts, you got a little more insight into that today. And now, because we have a little bit of time, we're going to keep on rolling into the mailbag and finally get some of those questions that you guys have been sending in week after week. Listener mail. Listener mail. Listeners write in. Listeners write in. All right, Bob, take a nice refreshing drink of water there because we're about to dive into the mailbag. I know your your voice is pretty probably pretty tired after that that long and detailed explanation, but we have more to go. So steal yourself, sir. We have some great questions coming in. First up, we have a question from Blake M coming out of Troy, New York. Scenic lovely Troy in upstate New York, home of Rensselaer. I know that area and he writes if I trade bullish risk reversals does the volatility premium give me an inherent advantage over collar slash bearish risk reversal trades? Thank you for your question there, Blake. A great one. We've touched on this a bit in the past on the show. Of course, bullish risk reversal being one of my favorite all-time trading strategies. I still use it all the time. It's a great way to put on a bullish position in a stock without trading the underlying or some of the other typical positions you might want to use. And just for those of you who aren't familiar with the position, of course, a bullish risk reversal entails selling an out-of-the-money put and buying an out-of-the-money call. A bearish risk reversal flips that around, buying the out-of-the-money put, selling the out-of-the-money call, and the collar is kind of a combination of that bearish risk reversal with an underlying equity position, so you're looking to protect it. So a couple of interesting things off the bat here, and, and you're right, Troy, on the outset, just looking at it from the surface, uh, when you look at a bullish risk reversal, what you're doing is essentially putting on, in most equities and most indices, the, essentially the opposite position of much of the market from a skew perspective. So if you look at what most of the market does in most of the underlying equities, particularly the large broad cap equities and most of the large indices, they come in, they're long the underlying and they like to buy puts to hedge it and write calls to generate income. So what that typically does in most major properties and most major options is it creates a pronounced shape to that skew that which you talked about many times on this show. It decreases the value of the call wing, increases the premium, increases the value of the put wing, sometimes markedly so, as we'll probably discuss in a little bit with one of our later questions. So if you come in and you take the other side of that trade, if you're selling the put wing, you're buying the call wing, by definition, you are at least taking the other side of that. Now, in a lot of scenarios where we see if the underlying will rally, the call wing will come off, that trade may not fare so well. Now, in a lot of scenarios, because you have that opposite position to a lot of the market, it actually can work out pretty well, particularly from a skew perspective. The one thing I might take a, a little bit of an issue with is if you have an advantage over some of these other types of traders, uh, the collar in particular, that's a different trade entirely. Someone who's putting on a collar, even though they're putting on a bearish risk reversal to go along with that, they're looking at something completely different. They're looking at really protecting a long underlying position. So for them, they have a different outlook than you. If the underlying drops, they want that protection. So they're looking at a different type of reward, a different type of scenario than you are with the long bullish risk reversal position. So I, I wouldn't say off the top of the bat you'd have an advantage over the collar traders because they're looking at it from a different perspective. They're not looking for the same thing as you. From someone who takes the other side of your trade and is looking at the bearish risk reversal, yes, they are coming at it with a deck a little bit stacked against them because if you look at the premiums here in the, in the call wing and the put wing, they're paying typically a very inflated volatility level for that put and they're writing a call 
that traditionally is somewhat undervalued from a volatility perspective. So they're not getting as much bang for their buck. It's diff more difficult for that trade to pay off in the near term than perhaps the uh, the bullish risk reversal. Of course, all of this is contingent on the type of underlying you're trading and what the skew is out in that product. I know back in my days when I traded S&P and I traded Intel, when I moved out into Intel, the skew shape there was markedly different than we saw out in the SPX. It was much steeper. So we saw a preponderance, pretty much all of the paper out there did nothing but write out of the money calls and buy out of the money puts, and they did it in size. So if you did anything that was not essentially putting that position on ahead of the customers in some way, shape, or form, trying to leg into positions that were short calls and long puts, it was a difficult road to hoe for you out there because just by the nature of the paper flow, you ended up being long a large amount of out of the money calls and short a large amount of out of the money puts, and that typically didn't work out very well. So I would also encourage you to be very familiar with the skew in your particular product and how it performs over time and how it has performed historically because certain products are much more favorable to the bullish risk reversal than others. But assuming you have a product with a steep type of skew like that, then yes, the bullish risk reversal does indeed have a a bit of an advantage over the bearish trader and i know if don were here he probably would say forget the the call portion just write that put and you have even more of an advantage uh so i'll i'll throw that little nod in for don as well bob what do you, do you have anything that you want to toss in here for our friend blake from troy new york yeah i um i really like your explanation i think it really hits the mark one thing i would just caution is that there should be a skew of some kind. Now, why do I say that? If the if the distribution of returns was perfectly normal, a normal distribution, in other words, a random distribution, okay, like, you know, flipping a coin kind of randomness. If if that were the case, then the skew should be non-existent. It should be flat. There should not be a skew. It wouldn't matter whether you're buying calls or puts because everything is random. The market could go up, it could go down, um, and by w whatever amount. But in our case, we do know that the distribution of returns for the, the stock market, the S&P, uh, or, or really any index, is, has a negative skew to it. It, it has larger drops and, and smaller huge gains, okay? Or, or, or should I say more large drops versus uh, fewer large gains. Now with that, then that, because of this skew uh, in the distribution, that leads to the skew in the uh, option premiums. And so just because there's a skew doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. Uh, you know, you look at the skew going, well, you know, it's not flat, so I must have some kind of advantage. You need the skew in options needs to be bigger than the distribution skew. Now, nobody knows that, um, you know, so, you know, that's, it's, you're, you're forecasting like everybody else uh, as to whether that's true or not. But if you were to look at, you know, a very long-term perspective of the S&P, it does have uh, uh, somewhat of an of a uh, negative skew to its distribution, which leads to the negative skew that you view uh, in, in option premiums. The, uh, the only thing is that generally that uh, option premium skew is too high. And so, you know, for the most part, you can just say, yes, I have an advantage by selling a put and buying a call because generally that option skew is more expensive than it should be, but there should be a skew. So I just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that too much because I can't think off the top of my head of any products that really don't exhibit any skew whatsoever because that would typically mean they have no paper flow. No one's trading them because skew comes about as a result of paper flow. So typically, if it's a product that trades at least one contract, you should have something of a skew in there that you could look at and try to decipher. Of course, that's why I like to say you always know your underlying, always know the skew and how it performs. You'd be surprised how many people neglect that very simple basic step. But if they, tra they trade a product, you know, so many people flock into Apple and everything else like that. We talked so many times on the show about how those calls, uh, you know, sometimes prior to earnings can get a ridiculously inflated level of premium. Then they get they get crushed the other side of it. So 
people are not even cognizant of those basic levels of what they're diving into, which is endlessly frustrating to me, but that's a whole other show, I think. I think instead, we'll take those caveats, keep them in mind, and we'll keep on rolling to the next question. Actually, this is one of our international listeners, Mitten out of Toronto, but he writes, I think I actually stepped on his toes a little bit here earlier in the show. I, I, you already answered this question. Mitten writes in, uh, when does, when it, or if does Volex plan to launch a real vol contract on commodities? I think a metals contract would be very popular and profitable for the exchange. Unfortunately, Mitten, I I stepped all over you earlier in the show, and you, Bob already answered this question. But I wanted to give you your two minutes of glory anyway, Mitten from Toronto. Thank you for writing in. Yeah, Bob already hit on that. It's coming down the pike. Uh, so hopefully, once they get all the NASDAQ stuff uh, straightened out, perhaps a metals contract will be on the horizon. I'd imagine gold and silver would be at the front of that list uh, for commodity-type products. Maybe corn as well, mix in a few ags. Uh, but yeah, or of course, you mentioned oil as well. Gold, I'd imagine oil... Gold, silver, and corn being probably the, the the quad selection of products you want to put in from a commodity perspective, Bob. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. Those are those are on the top of our list. So um, you know, if we can do it, we would love to. So we're, we're we'll work on that. Right now, we're focusing on on getting uh, volatility on indices up and running, um, but. You know, in the broad category, you know, of interest rate metals, uh, energy, commodities, uh, you know, we'd like to get something in in all those groups. And obviously, uh, gold is the, you know, the preeminent metal contract and and uh, crude oil is, you know, the 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 ultimate uh, energy contract. So, you know, the one you would think of are the ones we're probably going to focus on when we get to these other asset classes. Well, there you go, Mitten. So stay tuned, and hopefully we'll have something for you down the road that you can sink your teeth into. Next up, we have a question from Mike P. I'm not sure where he's writing from, but he says, Mark, are you aware of any research or can you bring on any guests to discuss the performance of at-the-money straddles during earnings cycles? It can be either from the short or long side. I'm surprised at the lack of available information on this topic, given the importance of the subject matter. This impacts pretty much every options trader at least once every quarter. Any light that you could shine on this through your fantastic radio network and website would be very much appreciated. Well, thank you for your kind words there, Mr. Mike P. And you're right. It is surprising how little research there really is publicly available on this subject, given the prevalence of its impact. Everyone, most options traders, retail, institutional, they're very active around earnings times, writing premium before earnings, buying premium before earnings. It's a very hot topic of discussion. And yet we have so many esoteric studies in the options and derivatives realm, and very few actually pertaining to this very meat and potatoes type of subject matter. And and so I, I saw your email, and I started mulling over in my head, and there, there aren't that many, really. You're right. There's only one I could think of that leaps to mind, and I think Mark Sebastian has discussed it on this show a few times in the past, is a Goldman study they've done. Uh, it was a few years back now. They've updated it a few times since. But they really looked at trading straddles going into earnings and essentially whether the straddle outperforms or underperforms in earnings week and post earnings and pre-earnings. And uh, they found in, in many of their scenarios that the straddle did indeed, it paid to own premium going into a uh, an earnings event. Now, glad Don's not here because I'm sure he was head would explode hearing me say that, Bob. <laughs> and maybe wherever <laughs> he is in Paris right now, his ears are burning. But yes, they found that over time, the owning of straddles going into earnings actually worked out. And if you think about it intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. You typically don't see a lot of decay exhibited going into an earnings event. You usually see that decay being offset and sometimes taken the other way because the just dramatic increase of implied volatility going into that earnings event. Think of it as a balloon. That balloon continues to inflate and to inflate, and all of that decay is essentially uh, delayed or deferred until after the earnings announcement when it all comes out and that balloon is popped. Uh, they actually found some interesting corollaries to that study and some interesting findings. That The last update I saw on it was, I think, July 2011. There may be some more recent updates on that. I'm sure if you search for Goldman Straddle study and Goldman Straddle earnings, things like that, you should find some some elements of this study. But they found something that is somewhat counterintuitive that, at least from July 2011, the latest version of this, they found that straddles going into earnings on 
what they call high dollar stocks, stocks, so extremely valuable ones, the Googles, the the Amazons, the Apples, things that were trading three, four, five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars. You would think intuitively those would be dramatically overpriced and they would underperform going into earnings, and the ones perhaps south of a hundred dollars were uh, the ones that would be underpriced and you could get a better deal in those. And what they found is actually exactly the opposite. They found that the larger names were typically underpriced from a straddle and vol perspective going into the earnings announcement. If you traded straddles going into earnings and some of these high dollar names, it's an expensive proposition. You're talking about $30, $40 straddles probably, if not more. But these things typically bounced uh, dramatically more than that going into earnings. So you had a good chance to scalp gamma, to make money on underlying movements, to make money on volatility. It was a, a better proposition overall. And that's somewhat surprising, I think, to a lot of people who would look at that data. They probably would expect the opposite of that result. And so, Bob, since Don isn't here, we can get into the realm of long premium a little bit. Uh, I know you were saying before the show that this, you kind of agree with me, this is, for as important of a topic as this is, this really is an underserved area of volatility research, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I don't really know, uh, you know, many studies like, like, the, uh, like Mike says. But the one, I, I do have an intuitive, uh, let's say, answer uh, or, or thought on this. And, you know, I, I'd like to see more of the research, but, you know, let's suppose that you're buying, you know, a straddle a week before the earnings announcement. Okay. And you're saying, okay, I think that people are going to start, you know, uh, you know, jumping into these options. They're going to start buying these straddles because they're over the week, they're going to be, uh, you know, looking for this big pop in earnings, right? And so what happens is you're probably right. Uh, time decay is trying to suck it out while people, you know, they don't want to pay for the, the time decay over time. So they're going to start trickling in and trickle in. And then, you know, most people are buying it, say, Thursday afternoon, waiting for, you know, Friday, the Friday announcement or something like that, because they they want as little time decay as possible, right? So so there are a lot of these people that are are going to be jumping in sort of at the last minute, bidding up the price. Okay, so in general, then you would say, well, I'm going to buy straddles, you know, a week before, and I'm going to get out before the event. And the reason is I'm going to be, you know, trying to take advantage of this implied volatility run up. The problem is, is that the options are decaying while the implied is bumping up. So you end up, you know, like I said, I, I need to see the research, but intuitively I would say you'd probably end up at break even uh, holding these options for, for four or five days because the event didn't happen yet. You know, everybody's waiting for Friday, right? And then if you do play the you know, Friday earnings game, well, that's a different game, right? Um, you're, you're now playing whether the earnings are sufficient and, you know, it moves the stock enough to, to actually make it worth it. But if, if you're in my original hypothesis is that I'm going to be buying these a week ahead of time because implied volatility always seems to go up into earnings. Okay. That makes sense. And it does, but you know, whether it just offsets the, the time decay and you end up breaking even is really the question. Yeah, you know, it is an interesting question. And we do see a lot of people doing exactly that. They pick up straddles or long premium positions going into earnings week and they try to just essentially scalp the gamma and see if they can get a free week's worth of scalps in. And if they get a dramatic move going into the event, then, hey, they can take it off and for a little bit of a profit perhaps. But usually, you're right, a lot of people, the professional side anyway, will tend to take it off prior to the event because you've already had your free week, you had your little bit of a shot, and going into the event itself, you're right, it is very much a different game at that point. You're playing expectations, you're playing all kinds of after-hours stuff, and there's all kinds of dramatic things that could happen post-earnings event that you may or may not want to be exposed to. So you can, if you if you just pick up those positions quite frequently, not always, but quite frequently, you'll see a lot of the implied vol rushing in will offset some of that decay coming out, and it can make it 
a little bit easier to scalp, provided you get some movement going into the event. And sometimes that underlying is locked going into the earnings because everyone's waiting for that big event and you don't get much of a, of a bang at all. So it may not be worth your, your time. It really depends on the underlying. But of course, some of the big names we've seen of late, Apple and others. Look at Apple last this past week. It had a dramatic move. If you had something going on into earnings week this week, long premium perspective, that could have worked out pretty well. So And you could have taken it off before, well before earnings and, and done all right. So it depends on the underlying. That, of course, gets back to what Goldman was saying of some of these high dollar names exhibiting more movements, more characteristic that make it favorable to be long premium going into into earnings events, which I, I know is heresy for a lot of our listeners who love to trade from the dark side, including Don. Uh, so perhaps we'll cut it there before we offend too many of them anymore there, Bob. And we'll roll on into our final segment, the crystal ball segment. And now we take a look at the crystal ball. All right, and welcome to the Crystal Ball. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we peer into our crystal balls and attempt to divine what the Vol gods hold in store for us down the road. And as you mentioned at the top of the show, it was an extremely volatile week from an S&P, from a NASDAQ, from an underlying and gold perspective, from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, I'll be curious to see if we can keep that up over the coming week. I think a lot of people would wager that we probably can't. We might see realized vol come off a little bit. Of course, we do have some things on the table next week that might kick the market into high gear, either north or south. Of course, I mentioned earlier in the show the Apple earnings, and that is usually a, a very dramatic event. Of course, we could have seen the Apple move already. Apple, as we're recording the show, still south of the 400 handle, trading 395, roughly up about $3 on the day. So Apple could have already exhibited his move, and the Apple earnings could be a non-event, or this could be the start of a very tumultuous road for Apple. Of course, you have Amazon and others coming this week, next week forward. A lot of big names that could inject a little bit of vol premium into this marketplace. I don't know if we're going to see those highs again of last week where we saw on Monday that Bob was just saying that those record gaps up like we saw in the VIX futures and the VIX cash, but who knows? You might see a little bit more air coming into this market before it, it eventually peters out. What say you there, Bob? <clears throat> I would be a seller of volatility now. I'm not like Don that's, that's always, you know, uh, always short, so to speak, like short or not. <laughs> um, I I like to play both sides. I like to buy it when it's low. I do know that when it's when it's low, you can still get hurt. You know, it could stay low for a long time if nothing happens. But um, generally, I think the the big spike is is over. I think for the next week or two, we're probably going to rally in the S and P and continue the the bull market. And, and consequently drop the volatility. So you think the bulls are back in force and we're going to have to see the slow erosion of vol like we saw over the past month or two in this ongoing bull rally that got a little bit of a hiccup this week, hence the vol implosion. So you don't, you kind of discounting then any of the big earnings events this week. You don't think they're really going to add much juice into the old balloon at all? Well, I've, I've never really been an earnings kind of focused person you know I, I i don't watch that too much i i i'm a little bit more technical chart based in my you know my personal trading and i just think that the the drop here has gone kind of far enough for now uh i think it's gonna shoot back and it and it'll depend whether we're sort of topping out as to the extent of this next rally if it if it kind of lumbers for the next week or two and just, uh, you know, gains maybe 10, 20 points on the S&P, nothing major over the next two weeks, which it's a good move, but not great considering it dropped from almost 1,600 down to 1,540. So, uh, you know, if we get halfway back up to 1,575 and then we stop, then, you know, you could, you could see the next huge leg of the, uh, or next leg of the bear market continue. But I think we're still in uh, a very long-term bullish pattern that uh, is just playing out. And we are we just went through a little correction right now. Of course, I don't think anyone predicted what we saw last week in gold from a volatility perspective. But I think going forward, not too hard to predict it to predict that we probably won't see a repeat of those record levels in gold. We did get some good questions about gold. We didn't get a chance to get to them in the skew in gold. Maybe we'll get to them next week on the show. But uh, interesting stuff out there. And yet, of course, gold just 
this uh, crazy beast these days, really from a volatility perspective, keeping a lot of people active. Seeing, we're seeing a lot of traditionally retail and institutional traders who would focus more on the equity options and earnings season right now, taking a second look at gold because they're going farther afield to find vol, and gold certainly is a place where you could find some vol these days. So interesting one. We'll certainly keep an eye on that. I think we'll perhaps start rotating that into our vol review and perhaps our crystal ball a little more on our upcoming shows, as people have requested many times, more in the commodity realm, more ags, more gold, more metals, more what have you, more oil. So we'll we'll rotate that in on an as-needed basis, and certainly this week was an as-needed basis for the metals. So interesting stuff going on out there. Right, and I, I regarding gold, I would, um, you know, I'd start selling vol here. I, I think it's going to stabilize, and... Um, uh, you certainly don't want to be long volatility at this point. You know, the, the earthquake kind of happened already. What you're going to get after this point are kind of aftershocks, you know, but I, I can't imagine that gold would especially realize volatility spiking up above 40 and, and the vol of vol now over 300 to go up from there. I mean, that's just like, uh, you know, crazy nosebleed seats kind of thing already. So I know you're a um, Valcone aficionado, Bob, and I think from a gold perspective, we're so far off the Valcone now <laughs> that you can't even really. <laughs> it's it's the most screaming sell you probably ever seen from a volatility perspective. We're through the wafer, we're through the ice cream, we're through any part of the Valcone, and we're out into the shop next door uh, from a vol perspective. Oh yeah, absolutely. The the Valcone uh, is is just. Uh, you know, you're 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 beyond the 99th percentile. So there you go, listeners. That's our crystal ball segment for this week. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for volatility views this week. I want to thank Bob for joining me on the old program today. And before we go really quick, Bob, what's coming up in the land of Volex and Volex.us? Many, any, maybe any tweaks or upgrades to the site going on that may interest our listeners. Well, we actually have a, a board meeting early uh, next week, and we are going to be discussing uh, whether it, to expand our indices. Um, I have uh, outlined about 200 of them, and uh, we we wanted to um, – so that would be a tenfold increase in the number of assets that we follow. So we'll see if, uh, if the board goes for that and, uh, you know, what's involved and how much it costs and all that kind of thing. But uh, – I'd like to propose that, and I, I think that would really help uh, our users, uh, no matter what they trade, uh, because there will be, uh, if this passes, you know, there will be a whole bunch of metals, there will be a whole bunch of energy, a whole bunch of interest rate, uh, a whole bunch of ETFs, there will be a smattering of, of high, high cap stocks, uh, worldwide high cap, cap stocks, so we would really have a nice group of of our nine uh, realized volatility indices for each asset. And, and it could literally make us the biggest index producer in the world uh, if we did that, because we're talking about 2,400 different indices. <laughs> so it's quite, a, quite an ambitious project. So we'll see where, where, where it goes. There you go, Bob. Dare to dream. I like it. Think big. <laughs> As the man said, actually, who built this building that I'm recording in right now, make no small dreams because they have no magic to stir men's souls. So there you go. Mr. There Burnham go. was and, right in that sense. <laughs> and and so, you know, we obviously aren't uh, trading on all of those indices or, or, or wouldn't be uh, very soon, uh, you know, even if we were really good at launching these things because, you know, that's uh, a huge number of indices and assets. But this this could really uh, help traders, portfolio managers, uh, you know, get a good perspective on volatility and price risk. And, uh, you know, having these indices at your fingertips, whether they're on Bloomberg or on our website or whatever, um, I think could be a, a big help for, for people's, uh, you know, regular trading, regardless of whether they're trading uh, volatility. But specific, uh, you know, certainly it would help uh, any option kind of uh, trading analysis to, to have those kinds of things. So, so we're, we're interested in providing that uh, service to everyone. 
All right, and of course, before we go, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to this program and making it such a success. I want to apologize to all of you who wrote in. We didn't have a chance to get to everyone's email, so if you didn't hear your question, we'll get to you in a later episode. And before we go really quick, I just want to mention to all of our listeners who may be in the Chicago area next month, May 15th to be exact, that we'd love to see you. At our Options Insider premiere, Unusual Activity Forum, we're going to have a bunch of great guests, a bunch of great speakers. I'll be there. We'll have a lot. We'll have a floor tour of the CBOE. You can see all of your favorite trading pits, SPX, VIX, Apple, Google, all that fun stuff. Uh, go down there and check it out before the floor goes away. It's, it's going to be a finite term on this deal, I'm assuming, from a, a floor tour perspective. Not too many more years of floor tours ahead of us. So if you want to check that out and see it before it's gone, this is your opportunity to get behind the security barricades and do it. Uh, nine bucks for all that fun stuff surf on over to the options slash events to check it out and see for yourself and if you're going to be in chicago on may 15th we'd love to see you down there at the cboe and that's going to do it for us here on the vol views program and we'll see you next time right here on volatility views Thank you for listening to Volatility Views. Join us next week as we keep our listeners on the cutting edge of finance and risk management with lively topics relating to volatility. Volatility Views is brought to you by the Volatility Exchange. If you'd like to learn more about vol contracts, please visit www.volx.us. If you'd like to submit a question for the hosts, then surf over to www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum and post your questions in the Volatility Views Forum. Questions can also be submitted via email at questions at theoptionsinsider.com or via Twitter at twitter.com slash options and twitter.com slash volx underscore info. Facebook users can submit their feedback via the Options Insider and Volatility Exchange Facebook pages. Voicemails are also welcome at 312-544-9356. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on Volatility Views. The views expressed on this program are not intended as investment advice and do not constitute an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any securities or other financial instruments and may not be relied upon in connection with the purchase or sale of any security or other financial instrument. The opinions presented on this program represent those of the speakers and do not reflect the views of either the Options Insider Incorporated or the Volex Group Corporation. The preceding program was a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.